welcome everyone uh, and uh, uh, we've taken a short break from heritage matters webinars because we completed 10 webinars and uh, what we did was an evaluation to see how we're going and uh, what are some of the suggestions and thanks to all of you who have uh, taken the time out either to call me send whatsapp messages and or actually uh, fill in the you know, survey form. It's really much appreciated. And uh, uh, we have had in the first 10 webinars over 5,300 participants, uh, 45, you know, panelists and uh, mostly architects and designers who are very interdisciplinary, uh, who are very much grounded in contemporary realities. And, uh, uh, and our participants came from and including the panelists from 129 countries. So it's been a, a global feature. And Heritage Matters webinars is a, a genuine seminar on the web. So we usually have three panelists and each panelist comes up with three to four ideas in a span of about eight minutes. And then we have a one hour, we have one hour of discussion. And the idea of it is that we need to think of seminal ideas. Why do we need to think of seminal ideas? Well, you know it better than me in different parts of the world where you come from, uh, that the triangulation of COVID-19, climate crisis, and the continuing gross inequities, um, you, you know, as reflected in Black Lives Matter, in India, Dalit Lives Matter, in Australia, Black Lives Matter, around the world, the whole question of inequities has surfaced uh, given the lockdown. So all these form the challenge for launching Heritage Matter webinar series. Uh, we conceptualized it in March uh, this year and we launched it on, uh, on the 18th, the series on the 18th of April. And uh, it's, we have had continuous support and interest and uh, very you know, engaging you know, participants and panelists. But what is our conviction? Our conviction is that the underlying conviction is that heritage, irrespective of its manifestation, is critical to, for our resilience to build post-pandemic futures. I use the word futures plural, just like when people say normal, I said, no, you know, there are multiple normalities that we'll have to deal with, uh, whatever they are. Uh, this resilience is the very ethos of sustainable development. Uh, and that's exactly what we're going to address here. But before I go on to this particular webinar, I once again appeal to people not to use the expression uh, social distancing because social distancing for those of us from the global south, but also people in the global north who belong to culturally and linguistically diverse groups, uh, it, it means basically discrimination. Uh, whether it's caste system in India, it's racism in Australia or United States, uh, social distancing is something that we all know about. It's historically practiced as a form of discrimination. So what we're really talking about physical distancing, hope you're all you know, uh, taking care and keeping well. And uh, now we move on to the, this webinar, which is called Writing Architecture. Uh, where we will interrogate the extent to which writing on architecture is accessible, relevant, and contextual. Accessible to whom? Only the architectural uh, uh, camaraderie or beyond? Uh, relevant to whom? To the context in which we live? And uh, contextual in the total uh, socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental sustainability of what we want to see the future to be. What is the state of the art with writing architecture? Has it been limited to the specialists? Can it become more interdisciplinary, accessible across specialisms, including tourism and journalism? In fact, two months ago, the Indian government launched the national, new national education policy after 36 years. It calls explicitly for interdisciplinarity. And uh, where I am at Anand National University, our board of management has uh, endorsed an interdisciplinary framework, the way we teach, research, and engage in architecture and uh, uh, design and creative practice. So what are the potentials and possibilities? Let's not define them, let's discuss and debate them. 
their range of opportunities as we forge forward with new discourses, new practices, what kinds of capabilities and capacities uh, to use Professor Amatya Sen's um, uh, the theoretical framework, do we need to embed in the professional and educational agencies? Uh, how do we assess the layers of significance in architecture to communicate placemaking and contextual places? Uh, and I say this diachronically, that is with historical depth uh, in time and synchronically in contemporary present, because there are many layers that we need to unravel not just look at a romanticized historical past, but all of this informs, as Professor Romila Thapo, well-known Indian historian says, contemporary past through which we appreciate and understand continually interpret, reinterpret the past. Could we promote a genre of writing architecture that is decolonized? Uh, in a lot of countries, you know, literature is still from uh, Global North is the one that's used for students, for reference, and yet we have such rich literature in languages of the South, uh, which is relevant, we're very engaging and uh, that we need to access both for our students and also for our practice. And uh, so the practice of writing architecture and local languages in a post-colonial context, it's, it's much wanted. And I think that that's something that we need to promote. These are some of the contestations because in each webinar we challenge uh, we challenge so that we can stimulate thinking among our participants, among ourselves that are participating here. Uh, in order to you know, provide the critical uh, engagement in this webinar, we are honored and privileged to have uh, Dr. Vendu Nurianti, who is professor of architecture and planning at Gajimada University, which is uh, number one university in uh, uh, in Indonesia. In fact, when I was at the Australian National University, uh, we had cross credits with Gaj University of Gajimada. But what is also important is that she played such an important role in the conservation of uh, Barabudur post the earthquake that she became world famous for the kind of professionalism and integrity through scholarship that she demonstrated and she became the Vice Minister of Education and Culture for Indonesia. Uh, how I wish we all have architects and planners and designers as ministers of education and culture. Wouldn't that be wonderful for our professions and our universities? And then we have uh, Nandini Somaya Sampath, uh, an architect and solicitor and director of SNK Somaya and Kalapa Consultants. And uh, I, I'm actually holding for you to look at one of the amazing, amazing monographs she just she produced last year. And what I love about it is it says an architectural monograph at the bottom. And uh, uh, it is a documentation and critical reflection on uh, uh, post-independent, the whole evolution of the architectural discourse in India, but within a global context. And uh, uh, and this is the kind of writing that we need in Global South that is grounded in our own post-colonial realities. And then finally, we have architect Neha Nair, who is an assistant professor, one of my very young, brilliant colleagues in the Faculty of Architecture at Anant National University. And this is the next generation. You know, we, we, uh, we look up to, we look forward to in the way architectural discourse will evolve. And, uh, as is our usual practice in Heritage Matters webinars, each one of our panelists will speak for about eight minutes. And, uh, and then uh, we will open up for questions and discussions. So please use the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen and uh, send your questions very focused and relevant right, to this webinar. Uh, I will moderate them. All right, thank you very much. Now, I think I'm going to uh, hand over to Professor Vindu Nuriyanti. Professor Nuriyanti. Thank you so much, Professor Gala, for having me here. And I also must congratulate uh, Anand University for having this event. Uh, I think this is a wonderful event that talking about the very important and very unique topic, in fact, 
writing architecture because it's so little attention is being paid on this particular problem areas. So uh, I'm glad that this evening, you know, I can join uh, to meet all the important speakers tonight and meeting, meeting in bracket you, uh, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, when I got this title, Writing Architecture, I remember about a book on writing architecture by Carter Weissman, who said that for ages, architects have been criticized for speaking on insular language, known to some as archi-speak. So uh, speaking among themselves, understood by themselves, so, but anyone who produces, promote, and teaches architecture must depend on the accurate analysis in order to produce uh, the useful work of architecture. I think it's based centered on a core idea. Therefore, writing on the architecture should be inspirable from the design process itself. So writing and designing is actually is inspirable. So this is the one that more even uh, complicated area because of those intertwined uh, issues. I'm going to talk briefly about three things here. First of all, is about writing and the creative process and uh, second is about the Indonesian experience that I wish to, ex to share here with the audience. And the last one is what is the lesson learned about this writing architecture and how we move uh, ahead. First of all, writing is a creative process here that the nature of architecture itself with the creative element is a form of a black box. So it is like the uh, capturing lightning in the bottle because the creativity is a world of imagination. Creativity, imagination, and interpretation. So sometimes the, leap, the leaps of creativity is so fast that it cannot be structured into writing or language. So the, the architect leaps from imagination to ideas endlessly. This is, I, I think, the process which is highly uh, the opposite of the structure process like writing. So in my opinion, this is why architects don't believe in method, but believe in values. So it is not just about describing a space, but creating the feeling, creating the atmosphere of the space. So, okay, for the Indonesian experience, as you may uh, aware that Indonesia, we have the three, more than 350 years of colonization by the Dutch, contrasted with 200 years probably of British rule for India. So in Indonesia, there is a more oral tradition that writing tradition. This is even making more writing architecture uh, complicated because there are many layers of layer of architecture influences and expression over millennia, including the indigenous architecture, vernaculars, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, also in recent centuries, Dutch influences. So there is a great deal of cross-cutting sensitivity among all these layers. You cannot just write from a narrow architectural technical point of view, but you have to express the multidimensional space involving all the contextual, social, political, cultural, religious, and other elements of the architecture in your writing and interpretation. So uh, struggling with this layer of heritage here. So when we have to express the past heritage, always bring up to the present and the future, what to preserve, 
and how to justify the integration between the past, the present, and the future. So, uh, a last thing that how what is the lesson to be learned about this writing architecture here? That architecture to me is not just about buildings, but as, as a total cultural expression of contextual values, ethics, politically correctness, socially acceptability, environmental awareness, etc. So then writing no longer means just writing, but with the role of technologies now, I think, we have entered the uh, new era, the virtual reality, even the hyper realities. Those are the, you can show so much of the visual aspect and the context that are very dominant. So the last point I like to make here is that with this new landscape we facing of this game changer, people no longer treat written text in the same way or read the text as the same way as we used to do. We used to do. So we are so much more visually oriented in this era, the image oriented. The role of new technologies has become the new game changers that dominated by the image and visuality. So this is all the issues that we have to face now. And how do we do about this? And how do we transform the uh, tradition of writing is, uh, has to be uh, deal with. So all the question that Professor Gala was questioning, was asking before we start this webinar, I think very much relevant that make us think, how do we go about this? And how do we, or, and what is the implementation, the implication on our daily architectural designing, writing, and those intertwined between the two? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to have uh, after this uh, discussion with all you, and uh, I uh, return the time to you, Professor Gala. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Noriandi. Really appreciate it. Uh, you brought in so such richness conceptually. You talked about atmosphere of the place. You talked about, you referred to it, and you're a global expert on safeguarding intangible heritage, how intangible elements are also important, you know, as we deal with writing architecture. You, you mentioned ethics. You mentioned, you know, you know, blended, you know, the kind of blended situations we have right now. Uh, how do we rethink, you know, what is the role of image and what is the role of the discourse itself? Really appreciate that thought provoking uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Now you referred to ethics and one of the uh, people that I admire enormously in India about ethical approaches and their firm SNK associates is Nandini Sampat. Nandini, over to you now. By the way, I'm not doing detailed introductions because what we found with Heritage Matters webinars is people Google all the names before they decide to register for the webinar. So they know more about you than I can introduce in a short period of time. So Nandini, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it is wonderful to be a part of Heritage Matters series focusing on writing architecture today. I would like to thank Professor Amareswar Gala and Anant University for inviting me to be part of this webinar. We write to taste life twice, in the moment and in the retrospect. This is the words of a French Cuban American novelist, Anais Nin. After four decades of working in India and over 200 designed and built works, the time had come to document the incredible journey of the Indian architect, Binda Sumaya. It had to be her voice, the story of each project she had lived it, the simplicity in language, reflection of the architectural process and methodology, 
and bringing in people and subjects that have been integral part of her journey. It had to be a reflection of her belief that in her words, architecture through its design has to raise the human spirit of all those who pass through its doors. This led to the creation of the book, Brinda Somaya Works and Continuities. To briefly talk about the process of making this book, I thought I would cover it briefly. Uh, Amar's holding it up. Thank you, Amar. Uh, you. In three parts, uh, the team, the structure and the stories, and finally the writing. So when we first talk about the team, uh, Brinda Somaya has a gift of working with people with great ease and humility. She believes that her work is a lifetime of collaborations with the people of her studio, with her clients, and with her city and country. For the making of this book, her voice is loud and clear, but is constantly interwoven with the many individuals she has worked with, interacted with, and those that have been her companions and friends through the years. It took a dedicated team and the support of our foundation, Hekar, and our design studio, SNK, Tina Nusirabad, our book designer, and Mappin Publishing to bring out the book. We collaborated very closely with architect Rituraj Parikh to structure the book, Professor Mary Woods of Cornell University as our guide and consultant, and me as the editor of the book. My role was to ensure that the stories were told in the spirit and intention that Mrs. Sumaya had intended with great honesty, integrity, and a book that could be read by anyone who was interested in reading about her story. The second part I want to talk about is about structure and the stories. The book opens with a foreword by James Polchek, the renowned American architect, collaborator, and friend of Mrs. Sumaya. And it covers 13 projects or typologies of works of significance across the decades and is interspersed with conversations on India, on the city of Mumbai, and architecture and culture with Minister Arun Shori, the late Professor Kamu Ayer, Professor Mary Woods, and art historian Saryu Doshi. The book also contains a critical analysis of Brinda Somaya's work and collaborations in a series of essays authored by Australian author Professor John Lang, Professor Porus Olwala of Cornell University, American architects Todd Williams and Billy Sien, and many others. In conclusion of the book, it was essential to chronologically archive the over 200 design and built projects, which has been done in a thumbnail format with relevant details. Now to just the last portion, which is what we're speaking today, the writing. One day I will find the right words and they will be simple. The words of American novelist, Jack Kerouac. The process of writing is very subjective. Each author must find their own methodology. The process for this book began with Mrs. Sumaya recording her stories on each project individually and in great detail. This were then transcribed and then developed upon greater detail while being supported with photographs, drawings, and other ancillary materials to continue to visually balance the narrative. Architecture is not an easy profession. It is filled with challenges that must be met in order to deliver a built form of quality and as envisioned. It was important to address issues like women in construction, local arts and crafts, structural challenges, geographical and cultural issues, material and sustainable practice, and much more. While engaging with all of the above, we also had to maintain a strong sense of integrity and ethical standards. The story had to cover these across different dimensions, a narrative of the truth, of the ground realities, and of the achievements as well. Having worked with her for over a decade at the time when I was editing this book, I had the distinct advantage of understanding the projects the architect and the journey in a very unique perspective. But with that came a great responsibility to ensure that the final product that emerged was one that encompassed all of the above that I've spoken of with a sense of honesty and beauty, all of which we find in Binda Sumaya's work. I would like to just end with a reading from the introduction of the book, which was written by me. 
to have a chance to observe a successful woman at her profession is an experience that any individual is fortunate to witness. But I have seen a successful woman work, love and live. This is my fortune. Greater still that she is my mother. The lesson that she continues to impart each day is to work with great humility and that comes with ease when one is fiercely passionate about what they do. In her words, as an architect, I believe that all architectural practices that are inclusive and span our diverse population, be it economic or cultural, provide us with great satisfaction. Therefore, the motivation for inclusion and diversity should not come only from the desire to create a just society, but also because it leads to a better and more powerful creative processes and solutions. So thank you everyone. I very much look forward to uh, this panel and discussing the many points brought in by Dr. Gala and of course the other panelists. Thank you, Nandini, really appreciated it. I, I think you finished off by saying certain key things, understanding how, you know, that understanding that's there as we create uh, is, is something that needs to be shared and it needs to be shared, um, you know, with humility, you know, but also in very simple language. And I mean simple, not diminishing language itself, but re remembering Ernst Hemingway, when he wrote Old Man on the Sea and won the Nobel Prize for it, it was his 56th in a version revision, 56. Uh, it is one of the most amazing uh, books written. And I think if we can write with that kind of diction and clarity and understanding, I think that uh, everybody should become aware of, you know, uh, the, how architecture contributes to our sense of place and identity. And I think that you've raised a number of things and what I love is, you know, that long journey, you know, uh, of uh, Brinda Somaya that you so well, you and your colleagues documented as an amazing collaboration is consistently ethical and has got integrity. I think that's really critical in our doggy dog world where there's so much competition for you know, tenders and consultancies and so on. So it's, it's, it's uh, you know, this is, these are the kind of role models we need, but they have to be communicated. The values have to be communicated. And I think that's what you and your team have done a brilliant job. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to move on to young Nihanar. I keep saying young because at Anand National University, uh, we have a practice of, uh, engaging you know, in, e in each webinar with our young people. In fact, among the participants, there are a lot of young people. I think uh, uh, across the world, among our registered participants, you, not all the ones are online right now. Uh, there are a lot of them will be listening when they wake up or whatever, or when they finish their dinner. Uh, our young people, you know, and uh, Niha is part of that generation. So Nia is, is going to tell us what it, what it all means because this webinar is inspired by her, you know, as a young person wanting to start architectural journalism at my university. Nia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm very humbled and honored to be a part of this panel. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be among such, uh, uh, you know, esteemed speakers. Uh, to start with, uh, so I'm going to talk about what writing and what and how writing can play a role in architecture. So uh, architecture is usually understood and accepted as a profession with visuals as its means of communication, ranging from diagrams, drawings, models, sketches, architecture is predominantly perceived and explained in a visual format. So it cannot be denied that drawings are crucial and help shape the idea and result in the execution of the design. But a good draw and a good drawing should also uh, and can explain every detail that is a part of the building. And as a result, uh, quite often the importance of writing in architecture is debated, stating the drawings do all the work and hence words are uh, probably not required. But it is important to realize that any architectural intervention in the environment does not stop at its construction and it might goes much beyond. Uh, it is important that these implications are recorded and documented for today and for the future to look back 
because it has societal, cultural, economical, political associations, which need to be uh, interpreted and uh, evaluated and analyzed. So when we, uh, when we look back at history, a lot of information is derived from written materials and architecture by means of treatises and travelogues. They help us establish a connection with our heritage uh, of which no real architectural drawings are available. And these documents broaden our understanding as they include not just the built environment, but also the people and the culture. They are reminders uh, to all of us of the importance that words can play. Uh, and also as architecture students and as uh, faculties now, we, are, we have been taught and we teach how architecture is for the people of the society. And we often discuss how architecture shapes the society. And like how uh, I.M. Pei had said, architecture is a very mirror of your life. But this understanding, in my opinion, is limited to the architectural fraternity and fails to be, go beyond the close-knit community and to the, to the entire society in general. In the current times, when the society is much well-informed, uh, voices their opinions and participates actively in the society, it is crucial that the built environment is written about and, it's import and the importance of architecture in shaping its life is discussed with them directly. And to clarify my stand, I am not trying to say that writing is not already a part of uh, the field of architecture, but, uh, <clears throat> but rather I'm trying to say that the importance it holds and uh, I'm trying to emphasize the importance it holds and trying to discuss the limited practice of writing in this field. Uh, the society in my understanding, uh, the, the Indian cultural uh, situation, we still look when it, when, it, when it comes to history, we still look at the Indo-Islamic and the Indo-Sarsenic as our historic uh, built environment or as historic architecture. Uh, and it is because, probably because uh, from school books to Twitter, when it comes to history, this is what is portrayed as uh, historic or historic architecture or built environment. But the modern Indian architecture, the post-independent uh, uh, Indian built environment, the changes that were led and what created the entire post-Indian architecture, which uh, is a, and the start to which is what we see in the contemporary times, that is kind of faded away. And uh, with, with writing as a means, we can help realize the importance of uh, uh, this also as being as important and crucial as a part of our uh, country and the history that it has created. And uh, this probably, like I said, gets neglected or the post-independent gets neglected because of the lack of written material on it. And especially by uh, the people who've lived it or for that matter, Indian citizens, because we often have to uh, go back or refer to foreign citizens coming to our uh, country, understanding the situation, and then writing and talking about it. Uh, another important uh, observation that I would like to make is that most architectural writing is uh, often limited to the design of the building rather than its impacts and implications. Uh, I also believe that uh, writing about architecture shall help explore the complexities and mysteries that comprise not only the built, but also the unbuilt. The interwoven realities of mankind can surface only if they are written and discussed, not just within the fraternity, of course, but with the society as well. The intangible realities of beliefs, values, aspirations, technology, material, which behind, behind, like behind the camera, they are the ones which actually mold and uh, help manifest the built uh, design but they kind of get hidden uh, away and uh, they, they need to be brought back into, uh, into communication and discussions through writings. And India has had a very long uh, legacy of built environment and writing will help establish discussions and dialogues from diverse standpoints of study. So writing in any form, blogs to books, newspaper, magazine articles, research papers, should all uh, help create this dialogue and make built environment and architecture an inclusive and approachable field, which uh, often is considered uh, to be a niche part. And uh, making it interdisciplinary because uh, uh, within, not just within the architects and the designers, but following, in, following into the many different fields would also help uh, improve the, the, and bridge the gap that architecture and society usually uh, witnesses. Uh, one way of ensuring this, since I am in academia, I will 
obviously uh, a kind of uh, lean towards it is definitely including writing uh, in architecture in the educational system right from the undergraduate uh, programs by starting off little pieces of writing to offering uh, detailed specialized courses in the postgraduate which shall help make writing a regular and an inclusive uh, regular and in integral practice uh, and another aspect of uh, viewing like i said interdisciplinary now architecture like we all know it is not just about the design but it has engineering it has uh, laws that need to be taken care of it has economics to be understood it has cultural implications and this is uh, the multidiscipline inclusion that uh, i would like to insist and uh, talk about when uh, when all these perspectives start uh, building up and are discussed then there is uh, there is a more uh, approachability to uh, architecture among the society and within the people and the connection is much better established uh, the social media uh, that we are all uh, connected and bound by is already acting as a catalyst to play a huge role in diminishing the differences between the various fields that are there and the uh, architecture just needs to adapt and embrace embrace this change and uh, move forward with it and uh, uh, another another important um, aspect when when writing an architecture in our country especially is uh, to be discussed i would like to uh, add that writing in local languages should be encouraged again to to increase increase and improve the reach of the built environment among the different uh, people uh, including multiple perspectives of looking at the built environment initiating discussions of how the independent india was shaped and formed uh, and how it continues to make the society that we currently lived in are, are all these things that writing can do for the for the field of architecture and uh, this will not only help make everyone aware and informed but this awareness and information will probably imbibe a sense of responsibility and ownership to the built environment among the non architects or among society in general and hence we will be able to take better care of the built environment and also maybe build better so either ways we will be able to uh, writing will be able to help uh, is what i is what my opinion is and uh, to end it all uh, in hindi we often uh, use this phrase uh, which is kaha likha hai you know which means where is it written so i whenever we need any affirmation or a proof we we often go and uh, we often use this phrase in our conversation so i guess uh, we should uh, be ready and prepared to have an answer if somebody comes up and asks us kaha likha hai that's all that i would like to say thank you thank you neha that was wonderful so we look forward to a future of amazing writings you know from you know your generation and the next generation that you are teaching that you'll be teaching and i think that very well said you know from we need youth voices youth perspectives but also i just want to mention to the participants that uh, women in architectural writing women in architecture is still uh undervalued and this is where uh the brinda somaya book that nandini you know has produced actually foregrounds in many ways you know sort of the role of women in this uh but historically we still need to do research to understand because uh not much has been written but also you mention about you know what we often refer to as the js mill british colonial legacy is uh, you know the kind of hindu architecture islamic architecture we need to do a decolonize our discourse as we decolonize our discourse as you said um, we also need to start thinking of some of the jargon that we use like vernacular you know which is a legacy of modernity you know which is very uh, colonial legacy if you will and uh, and also we need to think of a whole range of other new uh, nuances that we address and i think that you know you and professor window both of you uh, referred to intangible heritage in fact all the three of you did and uh, so i'd like to get back to uh, to professor nurianti are you there professor nurianti we can't see you yes yeah. i'm here yes yes professor nurianti tell me uh you played such a significant role especially in the asia pacific with the unesco category center to center 
and uh, with Indonesia, you know, which uh, is one of the leading countries in the way it safeguards intangible heritage. To what extent has your, you know, particular expertise and knowledge and commitment to safeguarding living heritage contributed to the, you know, to the architectural discourse in Indonesia? Yeah, it's, it is uh, very challenging, you know, working in this area while what I said before, you have uh, so many layer of the architectural heritage. And as you know very well, we have uh, what 17,000 islands, more than 700 ethnic groups plus 400 languages. And then within that, could you imagine the traditional villages that spread out all over Indonesia? So this is both tangible and intangible. Then uh, it's not just it's not just about the ar architecture as a as a living space, but also architecture as a total expression of, of, of culture, of tradition, you know. So, the whole thing become very complicated when you actually deal with some of the islands are so developed, like Java, for example, which has more than 70 or maybe 80 population of all of Indonesia. And the rest, on the 16,999 islands with just a very little population. <laughs> so as you well know that all the gap, this gap, you know, it's not just about uh, number population, but also it's about the lack of the uh, uh, development. You deal with the most uh, remote remote island that probably uh, they live like in the primitive ways, but also you have uh, so modern cities like Jakarta, very much like Bombay, I think, uh, you know, big city, more than maybe 15 million uh, population in, in one city and traffic jams everywhere, but uh, it's not, I mean, less than three hours, you suddenly in the middle of the uh, remote island. So all the gap here, it becomes the, um, uh, what you call it, that when you deal with safeguarding, both tangible and intangible, then uh, the role of the community, which is the other one is so uh, advanced, so established with all kind of uh, uh, structure and and uh, civilization, but the rest are the community that living in a very subsistence level. So, of course, then you will have uh, the complexities in them of safeguarding uh, heritage in in both ways. So, therefore, I think you know, like uh, when we uh, uh, trying to establish all the category two centers, for we have to identify most a relevant uh, 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 issues that we have to face. Like for example, uh, the uh, Java men, you know, which is one of the most important uh, link in the civilization, basically in the cradle of civilization. So the, the uh, category two center of the Java man here, which is, which have links to all of uh, uh, Asia and Asia Pacific become uh, the center that we depends on how this uh, civilization become, become uh, the, the role model of all of, uh, islands. And the second one is we tr still trying this one is the category two center for the readiness uh, uh, human resource, especially for the heritage that you deal with disaster, like where I live now, you know, is a what, 20 minutes from Borobudur Temple, the biggest Buddhist temple in the world, 20 minutes away from Prabhanan, one of the biggest uh, temples, Hindu temple in the world. So within one hour, this is the, the influence of the tangible heritage, world level tangible, tangible heritage, but also only 15 minutes left Less than 15 minutes away, you have one of the most active volcano in the world, like Marapi. So all the potential disaster here, at the same time, I don't think that we, we would have uh, all the um, temples like Borobudur, like Prambanan, unless we have this 
the source of it is the volcano itself. So we see the volcano is like part of our intangible heritage, cultural heritage, actually. We don't see as a, yes, it is a geological phenomenon, but also is, it is a culture, a, a intangible source of intangible cultural heritage and our place. So it's just said the complexities. Thank you, President Yanti. Yes, complexity indeed. And uh, your emphasis on the way we seamlessly deal with that which is tangible and intangible as we create, because architecture is about creativity. And, uh, but we don't create in thin air, but we create in a context. And, uh, and I think that both in your publications, but also your public speeches, lectures, you've demonstrated this and also in practice. Uh, how you've impl implemented policies in this area. So really appreciate it. Now, one of the questions is coming, and I think it's Nandini who's going to address this. Um, it's coming all the way from near Jodhpur in the desert of Rajasthan, uh, from an amazing you know, family and community project uh, dealing with intangible heritage of indigenous architecture, indigenous culture. So, the director from there is asking the question that when we write, when we write this, what you call complexity, both of you did, where do the communities, you know, where do the community groups from those places, where do they stand in the writing architecture, both in the urban and rural areas? And I'm asking you this question, Nandini, because the volume you produced is a phenomenal collaboration that brought so many people together, so many voices together. And you made sure the first voice of the people who, uh, for lack of a better word, I'm using in architectural jargon, the clients, you know, you brought in their voices as well, the community groups. Uh, how, do, how do you do this? I mean, it's, it's so complicated. How did you come up with the methodology for this? Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I think it all comes down to inclusivity. We always talk about this um, as we work. Um, as architects, we have such a uh, important responsibility towards the built and the unbuilt. All these aspects that were just um, talked about by Dr. Nuryanti just now and yourself, Amar. And when we go, when we have the opportunity to look at any single project, you have to look. Um, at where you are, contextually where you are, what's the community you're looking at, what are the lives you're affecting. Of course, there's that direct responsibility to the client to make sure their vision and their requirements are adhered to. But it, especially in a country like India, where uh, Dr. Nuryanti also talked about this wonderful idea of layers of heritage, where we're blessed to have layers of heritage wherever we go. Um, and, you know, it's one of the gifts of working in India as an architect, I believe. And so when, when we have the opportunity to work, I think the first thing we do is understand the place, understand the context of where you are and really do research so you can respect that sense of space and identity and understanding. Where is it all coming from? And then of course, we bring that idea of context and history of the tangible and intangible into our design in, in many different ways. Um, I think for the last 40 years, um, I remember Ms. Sumaya first uh, convincing a client to please keep 5% of the project cost towards arts and crafts, local arts and crafts of where the project is we're doing. And we still do that today. Uh, we've managed to increase the budget over time as well. And it's been absolutely such an integral part of the design process to include the community in these different ways whether it's through arts and crafts, whether it's through uh, building itself, whether it's through the research process. And, and this is what I think has made our projects live on. Uh, many of the projects that we covered out of, uh, you know, almost all the projects we photographed, none had been uh, destroyed or removed after many, many years. They had become a part of the community. We photographed projects after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they were still standing there. And that in itself, I think, is, is reassurance to us that what we have built, we have done with respect to what has been around, so it didn't have to go away. Um, even when we uh, did the rehabilitation of the village in Kutch after the 
the earthquake, uh, which is one of the projects we've covered here, uh, that was in 2000. And we went back every five to eight years to see what was happening in the village. And we had a little girl there called Mezabin, and she must have been five or six years old when the village was devastated. And after uh, the restoration of their homes in the village, we recorded her life till date. And now she's a working girl, finished college. And we've seen Mezabin grow in that village that we managed to rehabilitate. So what has it meant for that person, for that community uh, and beyond? And of course, this extends right from the rural areas that we build in, right to the commercial big corporate projects where there is now, uh, you know, a CSR, a need for responsibility towards the community. So we can really cover the breadth, you know, there, there is that ability as architects to cover that breadth. So um, I think that's some of the ways we, we are able to do it. Nandini, that's wonderful the way you responded. There are many possibilities. It's not because of limitations. There are possibilities, but it needs us to rethink the way we move forward. So that's what you're saying. But I have, before I move on to the next comment or question, I just want to say one thing, Nandini. It'll be wonderful if you can actually write an article on the methodology of producing that volume. We would love to publish it internationally in, in one of the journals that I edit uh, from Champaign Urbana. We'd love to publish it. So please think about it. Now, I, next one is I want to read out a comment. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, uh, more to Neha. Neha, this is a compliment. Bravo, you're getting a compliment. Architects have been self indulged in research and theoretical or philosophical beliefs in writing. I agree with Nihan, our viewpoint to diversify. Great, architectural writing must reach out for the inclusivity and create awareness about the professional profession's goals to the broader audience. So there you are, Neha, you, you're getting a big support there. And uh, 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 but, uh, then, you know, like our participants come from many parts of the world, like I said, uh, so including small island development states. I mean, in fact, we had Alessandra Cummins as one of our panelists not all that long ago. So this is coming from the Caribbean, St. Lucia. Our architecture is labeled French colonial or British colonial as a result of a lot of our, as a result, a lot of our traditional and, uh, and uh, pre-colonial building techniques and materials are ignored. Do the panelists have any advice on reclaiming the narrative of a built heritage? Would renaming it be too ambitious? So I think we know about this in India and Afras Nuriyanti will say yes, also Indonesia, where we had to reclaim our you know, indigenous knowledge systems. Anybody on the panel, Ninga, do you want to have a go? How are you going to translate this into your future you know, uh, curricula and teaching? Uh, sure. Uh... So we, we also in our, like I said, we are, when it comes to history, we only refer to the Indo-Islamic and the Indo-Sarsanic. Uh, but interestingly, um, the, the word Indo, I think it is important to realize that when, when the Islamic architecture entered our country or when the, the colonial or the British architecture entered our country, because of the uh, local artisans who were actually building, the, the Indian, the Indo automatically got attached to these foreign styles and foreign uh, styles of building and architecture. And it, it created a new, uh, it, it created a new style uh, or a new uh, type in, in, uh, in totality. So I think uh, even when uh, in all the colonized places when architecture is referred to as uh, British or French, it is important to realize that there is always an, 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 a part of the uh, indigenous and the traditional uh, building styles and materials and techniques that are used. And uh, like, and, and writing, I think, is, and writing in, in terms of the, in addressing the society in general and writing uh, with, uh, with not the style of architecture as its uh, core, but the, the, the entire past or the history that led to this particular uh, style, if that is discussed, people realize the amalgamation of these two different uh, styles. And in terms of uh, renaming, uh, personally, I would, uh, I, I think that renaming usually 
and and since we we have a lot of renaming uh, city uh, states and uh, a history of renaming places in our country uh, prevalent i think renaming usually creates an agitation of being familiar with something and trying to enter, take a you know uh, turn it around but uh, the realization of this amalgamation is probably what will help uh, more than the entire renaming and creating it like a rebellious uh, activity so so thank you neha uh, would anyone else like to add first nuria and your nandini would you, would you like to add to that nandini go yeah. ahead well it's it's a i think most of our countries as amar you said uh, have have gone through this um many influences especially with architecture um you know it's interesting uh the way neha talked about it is we've got to uh talk about the different voices that are available in our country when it comes to architecture and you know there's there's such variety and diversity uh that's available and uh there are always labels put to it and there's so many technical aspects and so much historical references that we can go into uh what we must do is is i think uh look at it as our legacies and our treasures and and not um build what barriers or boundaries around them but actually embrace them as part of a rich history that we have and you know when i recall when we were uh, restoring the rajabai tower and you see the detailings exactly what neha was talking about there's an amalgamation of course there's such british colonial influence but then you'll see uh, you know men with turbans and animals from the jungles of of you know the maharashtra coastline and you know th there's such great beauty in architecture to see the amalgamation of details come together and to understand where that history came from and to understand the workmen who who actually you know uh, you know carved it out and the design that went into it there were students from jj college who had designed all these little details and so you know just to think about what one small carved piece like that and what is its history how was it formed and that it was a fusion of ideas and cultures and heritage that came together and that should be the celebration and the discussion so um of course i think um you know that's there are many ways to look at it but i would always think of it as a celebration thank you nandini that's why in our question we had layers of significance yes. and you know it's really critical thank you very much Professor Nuryanti, would you like to add to that? Yeah, um, yeah. The colonial architecture is one of the uh, uh, richness of Indonesian architecture. But again, as we all understood, sometimes we have to face the uh, the problem on what to preserve, to what extent that the colonial era uh, 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 still have the space in the. Uh, complexities of all the uh, architectures influence especially when you have this ethnic group they have all the traditional architecture all over indonesia and um, the condition of it as you well know the gap between the two are so uh, wide so again sometimes this kind of tensions that Uh, need to be overcome, uh, especially again to the uh, the involvement of the craftsmanships that is so different, you know, between the two uh, the two era, and you can see actually it's not just from the architecture uh, uh, style, architecture expression, but also how they shape the uh, community and the community behavior. so again the, uh, the the concept of space then become uh, our need to be redefined because sometimes you know for the uh, the local the, they tend not to have the privilege to uh, enjoy the the space in the architecture within the colonial era so all these things in some certain area still exist even though we yes we understand that we should uh uh be so grateful with with the uh, variety of the architectural history and uh, diversification in indonesia 
but uh, as we all well understand that the limitation of the knowledge, the level of education, and the uh, how we actually make use of the resources, the resource allocation within the space is is just uh, so much different. So uh, again, now when you compare between all those layers of architectural heritage within those different era, we can see that all the buildings, the quality of the building, the way they interpret the, the, the space, is not just in terms of physical, but also uh, non-physical, uh, it's just different. So uh, this become uh, sometimes uh, what you call it like a, a problematic when architect has to decide how this one will have to be uh, living together in, you know, harmoniously. So uh, I think that's what I need to, to add. Thank you so much, Professor Noriandi. I mean, all the three of you are getting compliments from Brazil to Rajasthan for your answers, you know, sort of, which is just amazing. And uh, in fact, from Brazil, uh, you know, uh, where they're dealing with a lot of these issues of architecture, decolonization, layers of significance is a very big thank you from an architect from Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, but what, what I want to do is take you to the next question to all of you, I think, from Spain. Architectural journalism is yet to be explored for sure. With the current generation and budding students, it is observed that mostly they're concerned on financial support of the profession, except for those who are passionate. In the recent past, there are many situations where people switching careers uh, would like to hear the opinions of the panelists on this. So anyone, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite outrageous in India known for saying that the majority of architecture graduates don't get jobs in, in their disciplines. So I think switching careers, you know, so who wants to go? Neha, you, it's your generation person from Spain who asked these questions, so go for it first. Uh Yes, I think uh, there is, uh, you can't really deny on uh, the entire financial, uh, you know, the, the finances being the primary importance and uh, due to which and other reasons people tend to switch uh, careers. But uh, like I said, if we, uh, if we start foraying into these parallel, so architecture is not just design, it has so many layers to it. And if we start, in, uh, you know, kind of accepting this fact, and not uh, really stick to this uh, closed bubble that usually, uh, I, I know I, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but then architects tend to stick to their own bubble. So maybe if, the, if, if, in, if in education we can uh, break that bubble, go beyond, uh, have interdisciplinary, um, the, the character of interdisciplinary imparted and imbibed in our education system itself, people will probably realize that studying architecture and then probably when they are at their careers, they don't really have to switch, but they can walk into these many different threads that lead from architecture into other, if at all, that is their interest, not necessarily leave it all behind because there are, uh, uh, there, there is an urban scale. There are laws that need to be taken care of when it comes to the built environment. There is, uh, there is economics, politics, culture, writing, uh, like, like we're discussing right now. So uh, with, with architecture as a background, there are many more uh, options that are possible and hence not necessarily uh, switching. Once we have that as, our, as what we teach at universities and uh, different colleges, maybe this, this act of switching will uh, reduce and uh, uh, having architecture as the base will uh, spread out into these multiple different fields that we are actually related to. Thank you, Neha. Anyone wants to add to that in the panel? Yeah, I'll say real quick, Amar. I think uh, it's a it's a very difficult profession where churning out a lot of architecture students. Um, it needs to be a profession where there's much more respect in India given to it. Um, you know, I switched the other way. I went from law to architecture. So being a lawyer where I see a completely different when a client comes to me, the way or goes to a doctor or goes to a chartered accountant the same respect should be given to architects, which I think 
has to has to evolve and happen in india and i think it's very tough for young students coming out uh, it's a very competitive area but like i said we all need to raise the bar of the architecture industry together whether it's ethics practice education all of it as one and and really you know bring up that standard and at the same time uh, talking about what neha said is we had the women in design conference earlier this year where we talked about architecture being the master of the arts and how the beauty of it is it touches all other professions so today with an education in architecture absolutely as she's saying you know you can go into photography you can go into graphic design archaeology i mean the world is your oyster really so um today's generation does have that ability to really flow beyond into film um into conservation so there's a lot to go beyond architecture that's the beauty of it as a subject but i think we really have to look seriously at the profession within india and how can we raise it um together uh, as as a community and and elevate it so that you know people can be proud to be architects and as tough as the profession is you want to remain in it thanks nandini professor nuriati would you like to add to that yeah uh, i think in indonesia being an architect sometimes uh uh is seen as a risky profession you know it could be risky either you very successful or you can fail so uh this uh division the gap between the two are so big so i think the the, the still the dialogue between whether architect is a uh, uh, professionals or architect as a scientist or the difference between architect as more as an artist or architect more as a as a a technocrat you know so this too uh, probably is something to do with the curriculum in the architectural teaching but uh, i guess is um, people still see sometimes that architecture is not really science you know it's more like a art, artist it's more like a, a, a art a, a world so uh, sometimes when you see one day i saw a treasure study in in indonesia that um most of the architect uh, graduate actually uh, more than 78% they work in the non architectural field so but they are very successful either as a banker or as a business uh, uh in the property side in the you know were non architectural field but they are very successful so i guess there's something to do with the one i just said before at the beginning of my speech which is creativity is the core of this world so is actually you creating some something that doesn't exist before something that from none to existence this this where the uh, creativity uh, 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 become the center of the profession so the, i think this is a powerful for the uh, any profession you know whatever you involve since you already trained in the in this world and is becoming uh, uh creating something you know uh, i think this probably is it's the privilege of the architects and they they, they no matter you know what what feel i think once you have this as a pillar of your journey then i think this uh, guarantee for success thank you for sonorianti that's very eloquent the way you explained it uh before i move on there's a uh wonderful suggestion perhaps this is for neha i'm just uh this is a uh, one of the global experts on intangible heritage and uh who specializes in folk life uh, one of the domains of intangible heritage safeguarding and uh suggesting that if you actually encourage students of architecture to discover discover their local architecture of their own areas uh and then they enjoy it they understand they appreciate it with full senses as we say in india hisas you know with all the senses and uh, and experience them in the built form then you'll begin a tradition of intangible heritage of architecture so let us as uh, she says 
write the rooms of all spaces, write the rooms of all spaces. That's a brilliant expression. I'll pass this on to you. Uh, uh, they should start at the beginning of learning and finish with the story of their professional practical projects. I mean, I'm sure you all agree because the question is whether you agree with that, what do you think? <laughs> I think? I think we all agree that in fact, if we can get them to feel with their senses. I mean, in fact, I taught a course on postgraduate course on intangible heritage two months ago. And because of the lockdown, I got all the Anand fellows who were my students uh, to work within their own homes, the intangible heritage of, you know, the uh, stories that their grandma told them, the lullabies that their mother sang, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, on festive occasions, what does the family cook? Uh, what is the architecture of their place? What is their streetscape? Uh, what do they grow in their garden? I mean, these are the kinds of things, you know, sort of, uh, it, it not only enriched their own appreciation as in their feedback, they've said this emphatically, but it also built a sense of belonging, you know, that uh, learning is not about something out there, but also here, it's both. And uh, so I think that's uh, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Sky Morrison from Toronto for your input. And uh, then I have another comment, I guess, also question um, from one of the most well-known anthropologists of India from the Northeast. Uh, who was the director of Indira Gandhi Rashtriya Manav Sangralia. Professor Nuriandi, that's like our National Museum of Anthropology, if you will. And uh, that the appreciation, what role museums, especially community grounded museums where the architecture design is locally grounded in the intangible heritage of the place uh, and the issues and concern uh, about promoting indigenous architecture uh, whether it's Indonesia, whether it's India, you know, if the panel would like to briefly address it. Um, the, the role of community-based museums that deal with living heritage in uh, promoting architectural discourse, indigenous architectural discourse. Anyone wants to answer? Come on, Professor Nuriyanti, you're an expert in this area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's definitely that's the key. Uh, that community is definitely the key of this uh, creating this uh, uh, architectural indigenous architecture, and this is I mean we deal with this like forever basically, and um, and uh, as as we can see all the traditional ar architecture in seventeen thousand island and they all uh, you know the different the gap and everything so become so. The indigenous, we can still see the, the indigenous architecture is that's around us, even within the, all the high rise buildings, you know, uh, they, they survive somehow. And so, uh, uh, what, what is the, the actually the, the key success for this or the resilience, uh, if I would say, the, uh, the, the power for them to, to become the very resilient in this days. I think is one is the Indonesian terminology, we call it like gotong royong. It means like we work together. This is from the lowest level in the village until the highest level in the society. The gotong royong concept is either you, you build a house, you build a, a village, it's based on the community-based uh, architecture. So uh, I think probably this is the most powerful uh, 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 that that ar architecture uh, uh, still sur survive no matter you know what influence from all this uh, globalization and and stuff. So this Gotong Royong concept until now even adapted by the the Ministry of Public Works and Housings to be the one of the policy that. Uh, the, the government and we also now are implementing this to uh, build homestays, you know, around uh, like 600 homestays around Borobudur uh, using this Gotong Royong concept, which is they build on themselves, which by, uh, by done by community and designed by community. 
and what uh, based on what community needs. So we adapted this into the modern uh, uh, system, especially for the uh, building materials, the building management, but still based on this Gotong Royong concepts. And this is just so wonderful, so beautiful to see how the diversity in the in of transforming the indigenous architecture into the modern era. Thanks, Professor Nuriandi. Thanks for that very illustrative response. Um, another, I mean, there are a lot of questions coming. We're running out of time, I hope. Uh, some of them are comments uh, asking whether you agree with it. So I'm going to read it out. Architectural vocabulary needs to be inclusive of local terminologies. And there's a need to rewrite local histories in the local context. Two panelists agree on the use of state language articles in architecture journals as a responsibility. I, I mean, this is a big issue that's coming up in many countries uh, that all the articles are written in English or French or whatever. And we need to write more uh, articles in local journals and uh, in the local languages. And I think it's really important Otherwise, so much of our living heritage and our knowledge systems are eroding very gradually. So if you don't do it, then we're going into neo-colonial discourse. And I can see all the three of you nodding, so I'm going to leave it there. And, uh, and boy, they're, they're coming very fast, these questions. And uh, oh, Nandini, this is the one for you and everybody, given I'm the only male here on this panel. Uh, what is the role of gender in writing architecture? <laughs> Anyone can answer, all the three of you can answer, <laughs> but Nandini has been, Short you know. Short question and powerful question. <laughs> um, it is a very interesting question. Actually, it's, it's got a, it's a double-edged sword when I think of it in many ways. Um, there shouldn't be any, any difference uh, when writing the architecture, but if I was to read the monograph we've brought out and maybe uh, some male monographs that have come out, um, you know, and there's so many, uh, this is one of the few uh, monographs on a woman architect that we've managed to bring out. And I think one of the most interesting differences is, is addressing other issues beyond yourself, beyond the architecture. And, and Ms. Sumaya says this a lot, what is beyond the buildings? And you know we've talked about so, so much of that today. We've talked about the tangible and the intangible. We've talked about communities. We, we, talk, we, we worry and we talk very much about construction labor and women in construction and how that works. Um, uh, so all these aspects that are beyond the building but such an integral part of discussing it when we are talking about the build form. And sometimes that gets lost in translation in, in certain, and I feel perhaps there's a more empathetic view coming from uh, women architects and even maybe writers. And I'm sure, you know, even Neha uh, will have comments on this as well. And, you know, whether we look at it with that motherly empathy in a different way, that it is this sense of responsibility for the larger good than just as a singular building. So that would be one aspect and I'm sure there are plenty more, but one perspective. <laughs> Would you, would you like to add to that, Professor Nurian? Do you've been a champion of? Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there is a very interesting question, and I think somehow I uh, I observed, you know, based on what my students' uh, response to the assignment, uh, I'm not sure whether this was only happened in Indonesia or somewhere else, but I see that women architecture students or women architect pay attention more into the behavior studies rather than uh, architectural expression per se. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the psychological space in terms of uh, digesting this psychological concept into the space rather than architectural expression, which is more usually uh, uh, physical expression and more like uh, outdoor look rather than the interior. So I'm not sure whether this one is valid uh, for, but at, 
at least what I observe for my students' uh, assignment, this is, you know, uh, somehow it seems like consistent. This this my observation. I don't know if this is too uh, early to conclude. Thank you. That's great. And uh, Neha, would you like to add to that? I think I will absolutely agree. Uh, like how Nandini said, the entire uh, the the you know being more empathetic comes naturally, maybe. And even when it comes to writing, I think that that will obviously reflect. And since we're talking about bridging the gap between architecture and society, when when you have not the built and not the design as the core of your uh, work, writing work, and when you're talking about how and what it is doing to the society, so when that becomes the hero of your uh, piece, automatically there is uh, a more acceptance to it. And I think uh, uh, gender does or may be playing a role in it, not saying that women, uh, men are not sensitive and uh, not empathetic, but uh, to some extent, I think that definitely, uh, you know, has, has a role in, in creating more empathy or in expressing more empathy rather. Thank you, all the three of you. I think this is something we need to continue and maybe we have a Heritage Matters webinar particularly focusing on uh, gender and writing architecture. I just, a couple of things that, a couple of comments from a professor of medicine, a medical practitioner who is a regular participant in our Heritage Matters webinars, uh, says two things which are really important. One is, we should not hesitate from changing names. Historically, we've always changed names or places, but so what if it you know, causes controversy, it causes debate, discussion, we start unraveling, doing history on the places. I, and, and I think that he encourages us to not hesitate. The second thing, I think I totally agree with him. Uh, so there's no discussion on this as a facilitator, I think yeah. um, that, so much of what is written is not accessible for pe people to read. And he as a medical practitioner would like to read a bit more about architecture that is accessible, you know, for people who are not from the architectural profession. So I think that's one of the goal reasons why Neha is starting on a new journey in her life and uh, we all support her. And, uh, and then there's one, question, which I just leave it for the, for, for the panel to mull over. How is our architecture connected to spirituality? Uh, um, the question is spirituality, not religion. So there's a big difference between the two, although they interweave. Uh, but I want to come to the last question because we're running out of time. Uh, is many scholars conduct research on community, but sometimes they treat the community as merely as an object. They take data, analyze, and make writing for publications. Sometimes there's no benefit for the local people. What do you think about it? I think it comes back to all the three of you. And uh, uh, Professor Nuryanti, you talked about ethics. Nandini, you know, the whole ethical practice. Neha is uh, talking about ethics or community engagement. I'll leave it for all the three of you because this is, this is a malady not only here, but elsewhere in the world too. Uh, in Australia, we really have to specifically come up with policies and approaches, funding guidelines to make sure that this kind of knowledge extraction from you know, community groups you know, doesn't become exploitative. And, uh, and I think that you know, policies are important, but I really like to, and I think our panelists would like to hear from uh, all the three of you, what do you think about this extraction of knowledge from community groups, extraction of knowledge from elders, and uh, but they're not necessarily written into our narrative. Anyone wants to go? Nandini, you can kickstart this because you you really, um, you know, you emphasize ethics in your writings. I think so that that there are two parts to to this this conversation, and I think one is um, you know the need for documentation is really the need of the hour, especially in India. And I I know that uh, we brought out another book about the traditional homes uh, of Kurg in Karnataka, where we're from, because so many of them were being wiped out, and 
with that the intangible tangible the history the know how and the local history so i think documentation and will help ensure that the correct um credit and and understanding of what has gone before is given to the right people and i think that has to be done much more in india and in a much more structured fashion and and the second part is of course you know uh, uh, as far as making sure this this language gets communicated through writing uh, making sure that uh, you know architects uh, are respectful of what has gone before and it's definitely an ethical issue i think ethics has to span everything from respect of what has gone before to the manner in which architects work to the community to a government level i think it has to be porous across all these aspects and only then you know can a professional really rise up and you know fight for what is right because you can only have a voice if your ethics are clean and i think often you can't fight for what is right if you're not doing the right thing and that's why architects often fall silent uh, you know and are not able to be heard so the more of us that can work ethically and work across a system is the greater voice we will have neha would you like to join in you know how uh, yes how you uh, could deal with this uh, uh, like uh, with uh, with a lot of our students uh, since we are in amdabad and we have a very rich uh, you know indigenous architecture here we often go uh, along with our students to document the pole houses of uh, amdabad and uh, speak to the people talk to them take their photographs have their uh, stories written down or recorded and even little things that the students uh, that we've observed uh, they do uh, showing them the photographs that is clicked or maybe uh, getting them get a, a few of them have actually gotten back to the people showing the drawings of their houses maybe discussing the The, the measure drawings that they do with the owners and with the residents of the houses even little like things like this kind of gets gives the gives a, a sense of relief and uh, you know pride to the people who are being documented who are being spoken to who who live in the in those areas and these little things also have a huge role to play in in cre- in making uh, them inclusive of this entire part of documenting the architecture uh, of that region Yeah, thanks, Neha. So, field work methods, community engagement, ethics of community engagement. These are some of the critical areas, and I think Nandini emphasized, you know, very much about importance of documentation. But the question always comes back: uh, It's not only here in India. This is a global concern. As a UNESCO uh, expert internationally, I can say that these concerns are international. But the question always remains. who owns whose heritage who owns whose knowledge who copyrights you know whose voice i mean these are critical issues that continue uh professor nurianti you are very very conscious of these things and as a minister you were quite emphatic about the recognition of the diversity of communities and the ethics in community engagement would you like to add to this yeah yeah is so challenging in indonesia especially we are so much space on the oral tradition rather than uh, written tradition that's number one and also when you talk about the um, the community uh, for example like when we we uh, managed to um, to establish what we call like intangible cultural heritage board in order to have uh, a uh, select identify and then at the end uh, contribute to the uh, the uh, conservation of the or safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage we have to think about uh, whether uh, this uh, politically correct in term of you know whether this one is equally distributed you know we need to have one from the eastern part of indonesia one we need to have from the from the uh, region that is probably uh, politically uh, fragile for for indonesia for the for the nation so, so all the political arena like that it becomes one of the constituent 
reason which is not easy to deal with. So uh, when we establish the uh, intangible culture heritage uh, committee in the national level, both actually one is a national uh, a committee for the uh, for the heritage for the building heritage and the other one is for intangible culture heritage and both have to start with something national level committee who has uh, who has to do the uh, uh, the form of the lower level like the provincial level we have 34 provinces all over indonesia so this national level then become the umbrella the main umbrella of the provincial levels and then the provincial level has to be the umbrella of the district levels so we have all over the country we have more than 600 uh, district level so now uh, since 2011 this is when the first time uh, it was established until now we and every district in indonesia we have this committee so like three layers of the committee who is responsible to safeguarding all the intangible culture heritage and the other committee is for the uh, head, uh, uh, building heritage so even though you know we we have a very limited uh, extract of knowledge and sometime when we need some urgent or some important uh, uh, documents we have to go and we have to find in the ITLV in in Netherlands you know still well uh, kept there so all these things we still have to find out how can we have uh, access or how can we sort of manage satelliting this uh, center become one of our uh, knowledge center all the heritage so again um, to face all the, the 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 levels also at the same time because it's, it's centrally planned everything is centrally managed but at the same time you have to have like uh, the decentralization issues but then the heritage sometimes you caught in between all those uh, levels of the policy making so again uh, probably different country has uh, or face different problem but you can see that all this is not you know very easy and it needs uh, sometimes to uh, really put everything on the table Professor Nuriandi, everything you've said underlines one thing that is policy 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 we need yes. to have policy frameworks and this is something not only in india but in many parts of the world uh, it has become a challenge and unesco has been advocating for you know policies in this in diverse areas that you've referred to now as we finish i just want to get back to niha niha's uh, presentation where she referred to imp and uh, uh, this morning, I was in a one hour long meeting with the mayor's office of Suja. You know, I am Pei comes from, was born in Suja, comes from there. He, some of his great work can be seen in Suja in China. I'm a technical advisor to the mayor's office in Suja and trying to formulate a research project with Anand National University. Hopefully, some of the young people from Anand will be able to visit Suja in the near future. But the one thing that we were discussing this morning, which has come up as a question, is uh, you know not just how is architecture connected to spirituality, which is the question that's come up from our, one of our participants. How can we capture the spirit of the place, including the layers of significance, whether it's spiritual, cultural, social, uh, economic, environmental, but in a holistic paradigm, does the spiritual hold the glue. I mean, this was one of the things we were discussing this morning. So would each of you panelists very briefly, because we run out of time, uh, address this question, how is architecture, how, what is the role of spirituality in architecture and architectural writing? Well, if you take Indonesia as an example, as you know, that we live in the spiritual world. <laughs> so uh, successful architecture, it means that if you create a spirit in the architecture. <laughs> so um, everything has not something to do with spirituality here. Even though you, the, the, 
you know, I'm sure you have like the Feng Shui of uh, India, what you call it, like Vastu, I think, the Vastu. And the, uh, you know, we, we have that in every layer, the, fail, the lowest level of the community, we have that spirituality framework of mind. So and, and where uh, the, the orientation of the house, the door, the uh, windows, all this roof, all this, uh, the shape of the roof is everything is, is related to spirituality. The connection to the vertical connection, the connection with the, uh, our environment, you know, like in Bali, we, we have this Trihita karan, Karana, which is the relation with the God, the relation with the environment and the human relation. So all of this layer, all of this uh, spiritual dimension has to be in the architecture uh, works. Thank you, Professor Nurianti. We talk about holistic approaches, but to put them into practice, both in teaching as well as practice is a challenge. It needs rethinking. Yeah, and uh, Nandini, do you want to add to this? I think really quick, I think as when we're all, when we think of our childhood, there are certain spaces that come tunneling back into our minds. And why is that? And as architects, we're so blessed with the ability to build spaces that will contain memories forever. I mean, you walk into uh, historic homes and they're telling you stories as you're walking through these spaces. And so there is spirit of spaces, there's no doubt. And, and we're fortunate to be able to, to create the physicality of those forms. Um, when it comes to writing, I think, you know, words are powerful to be able to convey that is, is possible. Possibly, you know, we've, we've read so many beautiful interpretations of spaces and um, there is poetry in, 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 in that as well. So as they say, poetry in writing and poetry in space, it all amalgamates together. Thanks, Nandini. The poetics of space, I forget the author's name. Uh, there's so much that's come out of Europe and uh, but also historically in many other parts of the world. And, uh, but you said that, you summed it up in words, words. It's, uh, what, do we have the diction, you know, to communicate? Uh, what kind of words, the crafting, word crafting, you know, is really critical in this, in the way we communicate. Nia, I'll leave the final comment with you, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, I would also agree that spirituality is ingrained in spaces. They're, they have to have that quality and for a, for a human being to be able to feel the, the depth of it. If you want, to f the, if you want to f a, a person to feel scared, if you want them to feel lonely, if you want them to feel warm and, uh, uh, you know, everything, all of that uh, ultimately boils down to sp uh, spirituality. And then even when we're discussing design studios with students, it is beyond the walls and the floor and the roof that they can make. We always want to push them and we strive to get the quality of the space that, uh, you know, the, the space that, that is required for the space. So achieving that quality becomes our prime uh, discourse and the dialogue that we create with the students is often that. So yes, uh, architecture, spirituality, you can never uh, really, you know, break that connection away. Thanks, Neha, that's wonderful. And uh, we had over 400 registrations, about 93 people actually real time logged in. And there'll be thousands who will be listening to the recordings, the soundbite and the will be uploaded uh, within a few days and the edited because there's noise reduction that we have to look at. The video the document will be on YouTube by hopefully within a week. So more people will be accessing this. One of the exciting things that I found out in the review process, talking to various people is uh, right from University of West Indies to uh, Zagreb to different parts of the world, the Heritage Matters webinars are being used in tutorials or discussions in universities. And also people are listening to them in the Nordic countries. There's a very strong interest uh, in the Nordic world and the Dutch uh, uh, area, uh, Dutch uh, Netherlands. So it goes global. I'd really appreciate uh, all, all the three of you, the time that you're given, but I also appreciate Sharvari Mehta who's made this, hey, make yourself visible, Sharvari. 
you know, who, without whom I can't do these Heritage Matters webinars. And uh, Vishal Bhayev, you know, and his team who actually helped us with the technical side. So all, to everybody, I'm extremely grateful for having, you know, that we're able to establish this platform and will continue. So thank, there she is, thanks Shavari. And please give our best wishes to Vishal and uh, who else is there with you, technical support? Vishal. Vishal, okay, Vishal can hear. Vishal, can we see you once? Nobody has ever seen you in our Heritage Matters <laughs> webinars. Can we just see you once, please? They, they, they still quite a few people online. No, he's too shy. <laughs> he's too shy. And, uh, but Professor Windu, Professor Nuriantis, I know it's very late for you, but I'm really grateful, hope that David was making you cups of tea and uh, keeping you, you know, <laughs> focused. And uh, please give your fa wonderful family my best wishes. Uh, Nandini, I, I hope, Brinda is listening and so are the other people that you just, you, you, inspirational family. Uh, you're in, your family is an institution for me, in my opinion. Uh, thank you so much, not only from India, from the rest of the world, but the work that you and your mother and your family do, uh, it's, uh, it's inspirational, it's much needed. Neha, we're in your hands, you're the next generation. So all of us, I mean, there are a lot of people mm -hmm. are listening a uh, lot of people will be in touch. We're all together with you as you design your curricula and pedagogy uh, to develop a master's in architectural journalism. All the best. Thank you so much to all the three of you. And uh, it's a very, you know, it, it's wonderful. It's very emotional for me, especially to see Professor Nuriante because I had such great honor of working with her on the first ever World Culture Forum that she organized with the President of Indonesia. Uh, at the opening, we had 1,326 performance artists from around the world. How they were choreographed with the opening ceremony is just phenomenal, you know, from all over the world. And the panels, you know, opening keynote speech by Prince Ramathya Sen and uh, Farid Zakaria from CNN, and you name it, so many people that you brought together for Sir uh, it's, 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 you know, it was inspiration working with you. And I think you started a whole global discourse on culture and development. Until then it was more rhetoric, but you actually through case studies showed the practice. Nandini, look, please don't forget to send us invitations to your next book, whether you write it, so your mother writes it, whoever writes it. I have a collection here. And Neha, look yes. forward to seeing you soon on campus and we'll Absolutely. work together. Absolutely. And if I may, uh, I would like to uh, add to what Sky Morrison had, uh, had she had to say. Sure, sure. Uh, actually, uh, it's very interestingly, uh, one of the studios that we are offering at uh, Anant right now is actually on the same lines, taking the pandemic to our advantage where the students are in their different states and different cities. And they are working on an architectural project, which is at their at their home place. And very interestingly, students have realized how much they did not know about their own yeah. cities, because when they are in Ahmedabad studying and we take them all around the country for different sites and different projects, it is their own home place that they kind of yeah. automatically or tend to neglect, which is a realization that uh, the pandemic has helped us do in one of the studios offered. Yeah. Thanks, Neha. That's Thanks it. for finishing the webinar with those wonderful words. See, the next generation is one step ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night Thank and take care. Night. And be Thank safe. you for having us. Yeah. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gar. Thank you, Nandini. Thank you.